Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Fleet Safety, CSA, and SMS Pathway to a Safer Future conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Todd McCumber, Vice President of Risk Services with Hub International. Sir, you may begin your conference. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Todd McCumber, and I'm the President of Risk Services for Hub International. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to join us today on this important topic. Uh, CSA is a, is a new method that the Department of Transportation uses to assess carrier safety compliance. Um, for, for many organizations, it represents a, a seismic shift in the transportation industry uh, in terms of the regulatory landscape. Uh, many for hire and private fleets are struggling with the changes and must develop effective strategies to improve compliance with both their own drivers and owner operators. It's certainly a great topic uh, that we are excited to talk about today. Before we go ahead and get started, uh, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with Hub International and our risk services division, uh, I do want to just give you a couple uh, couple uh, facts on our group. Hub International is a leading uh, North American-based insurance brokerage that provides a broad array of property casualty, life and health, employee benefits, reinsurance, investment, and risk management products and services throughout offices located in North America. A couple quick facts. Uh, we are headquartered in Chicago. Uh, we do have offices. Uh, about 250 plus offices, about 4,500 employees uh, located throughout North America. Uh, we are currently actually just ranked the 10th largest global broker, and we have an extremely broad reach um, and have a network that we can uh, bind coverage in up to 75 plus countries worldwide. Now, our risk services division of HUB uh, is comprised of board certified and degreed safety, security, property, environmental, emergency, business continuity, and claims management professionals. And we average about 20 years' experience in a variety of industries. Uh, we have a number of specialty areas. I've listed them up here on the screen. And, and really, this variety of disciplines enables us to uh, respond to our clients' specific needs and objectives. The services that we offer are, are delivered through a number of internal risk consultants. Uh, these are board certified safety professionals, certified risk managers business continuity professionals, people that served in industry as former corporate safety and environmental directors and former risk managers. Um, so we, we do have a number of internal experts that we, uh, we utilize to our clients' behalf. In addition, we have a number of strategic partnerships to further extend our capabilities to, to serve our clients. Uh, some of these partnerships we're actually going to discuss at the end of this presentation. Now, I'm going to serve as the, uh, the moderator for today's webinar, and we have two main presenters, uh, Stan Turbyville and Jason Campbell. I'll give you quick bios on both. Stan Turbyville is a senior consultant supporting our uh, western region of the Risk Services Division, in addition to the Transportation Services Division and selected national accounts. Stan has over 30 years of progressive EHS leadership experience, holding positions such as Director of EHS and VP of Safety and Security for major Fortune 500 manufacturing and service industry companies, with significant private and for hire fleet exposures, oftentimes in the thousands. He is best known for helping organizations create integrated safety cultures that reduce losses and improve bottom line results. Jason Campbell is a senior consultant in our central region of the Risk Services Division. Jason has over 15 years' experience as a VP of Risk Management and Safety and Chief Operating Officer for two large Chicago based general contractors, overseeing large employee and vehicle counts as an on-site safety manager for a number of domestic and international refinery OSIPs, and as an outsourced risk manager for a professional employee organization with exposure to a variety of industries. Now, for today, we're going to cover a, a number of key areas. Um, I have the agenda up on the screen here. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the background overview, uh, obviously emphasizing key elements of CSA, the scoring basics, uh, some triggers for alerts, and intervention tools. I do want to get into some preparation steps in terms of what can carriers do to prepare and what can drivers do to compare, uh, prepare. Talk about some of the vendor partnerships that we have to assist our clients with compliance. And then definitely talk about final thoughts and comments. Now, certainly we can't exhaust the, the entire topic in an hour, but our intent is to really provide some basic information and overview on CSA and what clients can do to, to help uh, minimize their risk and help comply with them. Copy of the slides are currently available on Hub International and will be available uh, after the presentation via email request if requested. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so Stan, at this point, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to, to talk about the, uh, the topic at hand. Very good. Um, 
Basically, CSA stands for Compliance, Safety, and Accountability, and it's an initiative that was introduced on a limited scale with CSA 2010 uh, last year. The program went into full effect beginning January 1 of this year and represents a fundamental, if not seismic, shift in the Federal Motor Carrier and DOT's method of evaluation and enforcement. In the past, the DOT relied on boot, traditional boots on the ground, terminal inspection and audits, responding to complaints to assess a motor carrier safety fitness. With a limited number of enforcement officers to audit the hundreds of thousands of carriers, the system was at best reactionary, and the safer system, which this new program replaces, was constantly plagued with errors and dated and incomplete materials. What are some of the benefits that CSA anticipates, uh, the FMCSA anticipates uh, from this initiative? They believe that it's going to help lower crashes and hold carriers accountable. And the program leverages the use of technology by using safety performance data collected in the box, in other words, out on the road, through crash reports and those inspections. It uses that data to identify at-risk carriers and drivers and to pinpoint their safety performance issues. By alerting carriers early that they are on the Federal Motor Carrier's radar, the new model provides an opportunity for carriers to fix safety problems before they grow and get off the rate and uh, before they grow and then get off the radar quickly without the expense of a full compliance review. Because the data are updated monthly, the new model requires sustained monitoring and accountability for safe performance for both the carriers and the drivers and gives the carriers a tool to identify and address safety issues. At the heart of this new compliance enforcement process is the safety management system, known as SMS, and it's a data warehouse that accumulates and analyzes driver behaviors and incrementally builds a profile of carrier's compliance activities. Motor carriers that exceed certain thresholds are then targeted for progressive inspection and enforcement. So let's take a quick look at the process. It's basically a cycle. And there are three major elements. A new safety measurement system that's more comprehensive, creates a more comprehensive profile of carriers and drivers. It's better able to pinpoint the source of safety problems and better identifies high crash risk behaviors. It's done by taking on the right the input of thousands of inspections done every day and crash data that are inputted into the system and then coded into seven basics. Those basics are then evaluated, rated, and scored, and based on the accumulated information, a ranking or rating is given on each one of those seven basics. That then triggers a new set of intervention processes and tools. These are much more efficient than in the past, and there are a wider range of interventions to be applied to carriers to influence earlier in the process and they match the intervention with the level of safety performance. So it basically begins with, uh, and then will accumulate in a new way of safety fitness determination that's going to hit a larger segment of the industry on a more regular basis based on roadside performance and intervention results. The ratings will be continuously updated, conveying a current safety um, condition of any given carrier. And already we are seeing that many shippers are using this information to benchmark whether or not they're going to ship with a given carrier or what rates they're going to negotiate with, and as well as we're seeing insurance carriers becoming very interested in this information. It is a new method and model for the DOT and its focus is at-risk driver behavior and at-risk vehicle conditions, the things that cause crashes on the road. It uses the crash records and safety-based violations found at roadside inspections and interventions. It assesses the safety of carriers and CMV drivers based on those behaviors and conditions that lead to crashes and codes them into those seven basic um, areas. And these areas, um, only the violations 
that are within the control of the driver as deemed by the agency will count towards individual driver assessments. Carriers generally can't see historic driver assessments. They can view the results of assessments and activity while a, a given driver is with them. But there's another uh, tool that the Congress and the uh, Federal Motor Carrier has made available to carriers to check driver histories, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let's talk about the seven basics right now. First of all, um, excuse me. First of all, this uh, is unsafe driving parts 392 and 397. Fatigue driving hours of service, driver fitness, parts 383, 391. Your substance abuse testing, drug and alcohol, parts 382 and 392. Vehicle maintenance, 393, sections 396. Cargo related and load securement, parts 392, 393, and 397, plus the hazardous materials regulations. And then a crash indicator history based on the crashes reported through the states. Now, in the past, SafeStat was used um, to identify carriers for broader compliance reviews using a limited subset of information based on four areas called uh, safety evaluation areas. And they focused on safety management, driver, vehicle, and accident data. CMS leverages all safety violation data from all roadside inspection in all states and with its seven basics gets much more granular and targeted on the issues and the types of safety problems that can be surgically addressed with CSA interventions. Furthermore, data integrity, they've been used a system called data cues where carriers and drivers can go in and correct erroneous data, which is very important in making sure that the data wor is working for you. Now, I will say this, I've found in the process that some states are further along in implementing this information, but I rest assured that as this gains momentum, more and more states will get more, much more fully engaged because it's also, these violations also serve as a, a source of revenue um, as they are, uh, you know, when they write the tickets for these various violations. Now, some of the scoring basics. Um, there are literally white page documents with hundreds of pages of information on all the algorithms and the information that's contained on how these scores are calculated. And suffice it to say, this is going to be a very high level overview of that. Um, and, you know, to tell at the time, you don't need to know all of the engineering specs on your watch. You just need to know that it's accurate. And I, this process has been vetted for the past year or more, and I, I think it's safe to say. So we're going to cover just high, high level on how the scores are calculated. First of all, each roadside inspection violation is assigned to a base, one of the seven basic categories. And then a point value is based on its contribution to uh, crash risk severity on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, the violation... Um, uh, because the weight reflects the relative importance of each violation within a particular basic, you can't compare meaningfully across various basics. So you can't just simply add up all the different components. Again, it's a fairly complex algorithm. But once the basic points are assigned, then they're time-weighted. Um, a time-weighting uh, is from 1 to 3, a multiplier from 1 to 3. And the severity for six months or less is three, for six to 12 months is two, and 12 to 24 months is one. Um, also, out-of-service violation typically adds two additional points to the basic score of any given violation in an inspection. So once those, the formula is calculated and the points assigned, you know, anywhere from 10, 5, 10, per violation up to, I've seen as high as 36 in a, uh, in a given violation, um, do, those points stay with the motor carrier for 24 months and for the drivers for 36 months on the, this public access system. And as I said, more shippers and insurance companies are utilizing this information to determine uh, rates 
and whether or not they're shipping with any given uh, uh, motor carrier. Now, there are some other factors uh, that will go into uh, the, the adjustment of these scores, but let's look at an example uh, in terms of a vehicle maintenance issue. Brakes out of adjustment or contaminated brake lining like you see pictured below, or perhaps even a separated leaf spring, that generally is going to carry a, the maximum 10-point violation. It's also an out-of-service issue, which would garner two additional points, and because this happened in June of this year, has a three-point time multiplier um, for total for this one violation of 36 points attributed to the carrier. Now, they, they, they use some other factors such as segmentation and normalizing of the data, and I'll say that the normalizing is where they take and compare the number of power units you have with other carriers plus the number of vehicle miles traveled to, to create a normalized number uh, and influences the score. So it, uh, they try to take out the law of small numbers and average out the law of large numbers with that. Now, in terms of what do they do with the scores, these scores are accumulated and um, they are then calculated into a percentage for each given basic. Um, and you see on this table the threshold limits that begin to trigger activity from the Federal Motor Carrier towards a given um, uh, truck line or bus company or uh, shipper, uh, co shipping company. Uh, and for general carriers, it's 65% in unsafe driving, fatigue driving is 65%. Uh, and then you can see the, the percentages are around 80%, between 65 and 80%. They step down uh, with hazmat carriers, uh, 5 to 10 points in each category, and another 10 to uh, 10 uh, percentage points for passenger carriers. So there's a much lower threshold uh, that uh, passenger carrying companies are going to face uh, when, when these scores begin to accumulate. Uh, you should start seeing, if, if you get your uh, scores get above these thresholds, you will see the DOT begin to send out warning letters to a given motor carrier. It's going to result in increased inspection frequencies. As a carrier crosses these thresholds, the state patrols are going to be using this data to highlight and target carriers for additional inspections. And you will get progressive interventions the longer you stay uh, in the alert status. The point, the message here is that you ignore, if you ignore this information and these communications from the DOT, you can end up in a situation called cascade failure, where more inspections are piling up, accumulating to uh, higher frequency scores and, and more severe activity and enforcement uh, actions. So the new intervention tools, as I mentioned to start with, warning letters are a new intervention. Though some states um, and the CSA warning letters are sent to a larger number of carriers nationwide. This is likely to become a carrier's first contact with federal motor carrier enforcement, and it's a strong warning that the carrier's now on the federal motor carrier's radar. Uh, you've got to provide, you must improve your safety practices and results to get off the radar. So if a carrier continues with poor performance, it's going to be identified for additional inspections. The goal here, though, is self-correction. Uh, I've already gotten word that there have been some carriers that have already been put out of business in the six months that uh, this has gone live uh, because they have been so egregious and, and out of compliance as evidenced by their roadside inspections and their crash data. And the next level is investigations. Now, there are two basic types of investigations. First, on-site or off-site investigations where the DOT is going to contact you and begin a process of formal response and inquiry. 
And then the second would be on-site investigations that are focused on a specific area, and then on-site investigations that are comprehensive. The next level of activity are follow-up on corrective actions, and these can range from a cooperative safety plan, notice of violation, notice of claim where they're actually fining, and then out-of-service orders. So all of these um, uh, accumulate and will uh, cascade if you do not pay attention to them. So the question is, what can we do to prepare? And I would say that the first thing that you need to do is to change your attitude about this process. Um, the whole is the sum of the parts. Failure to recognize the scope and magnitude of this change is a recipe for disaster. However, company owners that rise to the challenge and provide the support and leadership are going to succeed. And we'll talk about some of these pivot points or these changes in attitude that really need to, need to take place with, across the industry at the driver level as well as the, as well as the carrier level if we're going to succeed in making the, the roadways safer with uh, large motor carriers uh, and commercial vehicles. For instance, um, let me just give you an example. Daily vehicle inspections. In the past, drivers treated this as a documentary nuisance. Pre and post trip inspections, we had to struggle to get drivers to participate in this. Many of the times, these things were pencil whipped. Uh, I, I had a situation, the first, one of the first times I observed a driver doing a pre trip inspection was on a, a bus that I was shuttle that I was getting ready to go to uh, the Atlanta airport from one of the northern suburbs. And the driver was doing his pre trip inspection on in the driver's seat and he was watching I Love Lucy and that was the entire summation. It was a pencil whipped exercise. Didn't exactly inspire confidence in me. But we've got to change the attitude of the drivers towards this function because I tell you it is now the line of scrimmage in the game. Preventing that violation, that vehicle condition, that defect from getting out into a roadside inspection now takes on new meaning. And we've got to instill new meaning to the drivers as leaders of our companies so that they are engaged fully in this process. The other thing, and so we've got to learn to stop the bleeding and focus on some low-hanging fruit. And we'll talk about areas such as driver qualifications, driver's logs, and post- and pre-trip inspections. Another area to change your attitude is a lot of times I've heard it kind of voiced in one way or the other. Well, the drivers are such a problem. It's those daggum owner operators. Well, it, the drivers, there may be some problems there, but I'm here to tell you they're also the solution. They're going to be the ones interfacing on those roadside inspections. They're the ones that are doing that walk around in the meetings, uh, in the mornings and, and doing those vehicle inspections. And it's essential that they engage uh, in this process. They have skin in the game. So what should you do? First of all, you need to adopt a footing of compliance, complying with the Federal Motor Carrier Regulations. Review your inspection and violation history for the last two years. It's up there on the website. You need to access it, and you need to um, uh, make sure that you're familiar with what, what the issues are. Um, and then stop the stupid mistakes now. And we'll talk about some of those in a little more detail. There are a number of errors that are made that are just simple, stupid mistakes that we can do to improve things like driver fitness, our logs, and, and get better scores on these compliance at, uh, inspections. Educate and engage your managers and drivers. You need to understand the basic SMS methodology, understand the seven basics. Communicate how driver's performance impacts their personal record and safety assessment of the carrier. Each time these guys get a violation on the road, it goes to the carrier. As, and as long as that driver is with you, he will continue to accumulate scores. So it's eventually going to create employment decisions for drivers that don't pay attention to these issues and don't get better at managing their vehicle and their time and themselves. 
the message here is that raise awareness. Every inspection and every violation counts. Manage the data or it's going to manage you. You can challenge the data at datacuesfmcsa.gov to make sure that it's accurate and if you have any issues with that data. Now, another tool that the Congress and the Federal Motor Carrier has made available to uh, motor carriers is the pre-employment screening program. It takes the data from all these inspections associated by driver and creates essentially a driving credit history that motor carriers can go during the pre-employment process and screen drivers and make hiring decisions based on a driver's behaviors out on the road. Just like shippers are going to be looking at carrier scores, motor carriers should be looking at driver scores as well and making informed decisions as part of the hiring process. So, some quick hits. Let's talk about those. First of all, register and check the website information for information and updates at uh, fmcsa.gov the CSA website listed on the page here. You want to log in and register your, and obtain your PIN number so that you can see all areas of your, your basic scores. The cargo securement and the crash data are sequestered from the general public and only available to the individual carriers. Um, you want to make sure you have up-to-date carrier census information utilizing the MCS 150. Um, and that really is the mileage and vehicle numbers. Routinely monitor and review the inspections and crash data. You want to challenge and correct any incorrect uh, data. Say if another carrier's inspection has been logged to your, your company because of a key punch error. And then respond to communications from the Federal Motor Carrier. You don't necessarily have to respond to some of the letters they send. I would highly advise that you do. You want to collaborate with your hub risk services professionals. We're a great resource to help you with various uh, compliance activities, policy reviews, and uh, various training activities. Let's take a look at um, the overview page for a given carrier. Um, this is the screen that you would see when you log into to, uh, the SMS system. And the first area here is the driver data, um, you can, or the carrier data. Uh, it shows the number of miles traveled, the number of vehicles, number of drivers. You want to make sure this information is right and correct because it will influence your final percentage scores in several of the basics. For instance, there was a carrier that showed uh, they were in the high 90 percentiles in a given area on vehicle maintenance, and they were in an alert status. When I went to their basic data, they had severely underreported their uh, mileage, uh, had left off several zeros in terms of their mileage, and was reporting hundreds of thousands of miles versus millions of miles. And when they got the information corrected, the, the data score, the final score normalized and brought them back under the alert level. Something as simple as that can, can be... Um, effective in maintaining it. Check the average number of miles per vehicle to make sure that that number is making sense with your operations. The next block of data is the inspection data. This gives you the number of vehicle inspections, the number of driver inspections, as well as, as information um, about the number of violations in each category. The next block is the number of, uh, is the seven basics and uh, each of them listed out and showing the score as it's accumulated to that point. Some are going to be uh, incomplete or not enough data present to score. But when um, the information rises above the threshold, you'll see the warning triangle and uh, the category will go into an alert status and will probably trigger uh, activity from the Federal Motor Carrier, at least in the form of one of the warning letters. Uh, also down in the bottom right-hand corner is information on how to help. Uh, there's great uh, resource information on how to improve your safety program in these various areas. 
From there, you can drill in on each basic, and that information um, go, takes you to a page uh, that's a composite of the two sli uh, slide portions that you see here. One shows the overall score. It shows your ranking uh, within comparison to other motor carriers in this area. Uh, there's an information center with additional resources and health uh, information that you can avail yourself of. You can further drill down into the information in a given basic. Uh, in the top area, it shows the violations by the basic categories of the violation. This one happens to be driver fatigue. And it shows the number of violations that are over hours violations, the number of violations that are form and manner to the, to the logs. And then you can drill down even further in the section just below that to the individual inspections and see the individual driver uh, and the individual uh, information generated on each inspection. Some of the top violations focus in uh, that uh, are driver focused are no surprise hours of service. The most common issues and the ones that the enforcement officers are very familiar with are uh, the hours of service rules. And you can see that on the bottom of this list, uh, one of the um, uh, most frequently cited are the the out of uh, exceeding the hours of service either for the daily of either of the daily limits and moving back up to the top half of the page things that are focused more towards um, uh, violations pertaining to driver fitness whether he's got his uh, certificate his license is up to date the correct license for the vehicle traveled and so forth so we talked about some of the mistakes and errors the stupid mistakes and errors and Folks, um, I'll call this, ladies and gentlemen, the put your pants on before you go to work uh, type of errors. Uh, not having a valid medical certificate on your person, not having a valid driver's license on your person, uh, not having the correct hazmat endorsements, um, you know, all of these things uh, are what I call very, very silly mistakes. And I would suggest that you implement if this is an issue that shows up in your data, that you implement periodic checks as part of every driver meeting. Uh, you say, okay, everybody pull out your medical card, pull out your license, make sure they're valid, make sure they're up to date and on your person. Uh, certainly, I would uh, have strong words with the driver that allowed these type of things that could result very easily in an out-of-service violation and impact your score. These are a list of vehicle violations, range from uh, brake, most centered around brakes and then marker lamps. Uh, other areas will include reflective uh, markers as well. Um, so these areas, what can we do to help the drivers prepare? Well, let's engage them. Do training on pre and post trip inspections. Get the CVSA 2011 out of service criteria. It's a very excellent reference tool, great reference tool for your drivers, and we put together training presentations to assess some of our clients uh, uh, with their, uh, this information. Ensure that the shops respond to the daily vehicle inspection reports and that you've got a system to monitor and measure that process correctly. Train your drivers how to represent you on roadside inspections, and then train drivers on basic hours of service and logging basics. Some quick hits, the pre and post trip competence, develop that with your drivers. Things like marker lights, lamps, um, brakes and brake hoses and tubings. I've pictured some typical, these are actual things that have been observed on actual roadside inspections. Reflective materials on, on your mud flaps and your trailers. All of these are essential. You know, one of the, the things that I've would strongly suggest in your next driver meeting, if you haven't done this already, make sure your drivers are equipped with a flashlight because they do their inspections during the morning and in the evenings when lighting can be poor. And they're supposed to be doing visual inspections. All the things that you'll see in this, the, uh, 
in this presentation and on roadside inspections are things done without special tools, out special devices, they're basic visual inspections. So there's no reason a driver should not see an out of service violation before it gets to a roadside inspection. Some tips that you can train your drivers on when they are at a roadside inspection, be professional, be polite, Adopt a learner's attitude, follow the instructions of the inspectors, enter the inspection on your daily log and note the officer's name and badge number. Ask the inspector, inspector or officer to point out any defects cited on the inspection and then if they have a camera, take in, uh, photos of the alleged defects. It may be that, that when you get it back to the shop, you might dispute the issue. Having that photographic evidence there would be essential in overturning it through the data queue process. And then ask, have your drivers ask for inspection reports, especially the good ones. Remember, this is the line of scrimmage. Train your team how to maintain a positive image of your company with enforcement personnel. So uh, these, these are the key uh, expectations I would have of any driver in my fleet. The next few slides are basically some reference uh, areas that the drivers, you can uh, direct the drivers to additional information where they can learn about CSA. Make sure that they have skin in the game and that they understand that this can eventually mean employment decisions made by employers on their uh, livelihood. So get them involved. Help them become advocates of CSA knowledge and compliance. Uh, have them become knowledgeable about the impact that these things are having on your carrier, motor carrier safety records. So um, we'll now move on. I'm going to turn this over to Jason, who will share with you some of our vendors that uh, can assist you with um, these items. Thank you, Stan. In the next few slides, I will discuss vendors vendors that Hub has partnered with to assist our clients with fleet-related solutions. First, I'll discuss National Driver Accountability Program, or NDAP. NDAP has proven to help companies significantly reduce accidents, decrease driver safety numbers, and as a result, save these companies money. NDAP has helped clients reduce accidents by upwards of 50%, and when automotive and workers' compensation losses are down, you save significantly. Another advantage is the increase you'll experience in your driver safety set statistics. Many companies hit their Department of Transportation numbers for the first time in years after using NDAP. The other is Alert Driving. Alert Driving is a company that pioneered web-based fleet risk management. The, the fleet defense programs have become the industry standards for global fleet risk management solutions. They provide clients with a single source, comprehensive, fleet risk identification and mitigation solution. Many Fortune 100 companies in over 30 countries use solutions developed by Alert Driving. The goal of the fleet defense is to reduce collisions, reduce injuries, reduce costs, and reduce liability exposures. The fleet defense system has been designed to accept inputs from other vendors, applicants such as claims data from an accident management vendor, or integrate seamlessly with the client's learning management system. The other vendor I'd like to discuss is End-to-End -end Process Management, EBE, which is a leading provider of integrated document and content management workflow and business process automation solutions designed specifically for the trucking industry. In partnering with EBE, Hub International can quickly bring to market a solution that provides our clients with improved driver safety management by implementing EBE's CSA dashboard application. Hub's clientele will have near real-time visibility to carrier and driver safety scores based on the new CSA methodology as publicly documented by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Providing this type of visible visibility offers more control to carriers to manage their safety ratings, which will be reflected in their insurance premiums. The last vendor I'd like to discuss is DriveCam. 90% of all collisions involve driver error. That's why the DriveCam program focuses on the causes of poor driving to eliminate driver error while preventing collisions, 
faulty claims, and waste of fuel. Their seven steps to risk reduction and savings include monitor driving, provide real-time feedback, upload video and data, analyze score and prioritize, access driver management portals, coach the driver, safe driver returns to the road, and best practice program reviews. Fleet Use and Drive Camp Solution realize millions of dollars in savings when they prevent collisions, prevent fraudulent claims, prevent fuel waste. Fleet also realize a variety of important indirect benefits from developing and maintaining a rural class safety culture with Drive Camp. You'll protect your drivers, protect your brand, and exemplify good corporate citizenship. Drive Cam is dedicated to helping drivers perform every day to the best of their ability while also delivering bottom line results. I will now turn it back over to Stan to summarize and discuss the next steps for motor carriers. Okay, needless to say, this is a fundamental seismic shift in enforcement strategy. It's moved from a very reactive, antiquated means of accruing uh, enforcement activity uh, to something that's more behavioral-based, for those of you who understand behavior-based safety. It uses crash records and all roadside inspections and safety-based violations in those inspections to determine a carrier or driver's safety rating. It assigns weight and time uh, uh, weightings to the violations based on relationship to crash risks. It calculates the safety performance in seven basic areas. Uh, it triggers a progressive intervention process that will feed safety fitness determinations. Folks, CSA is here to stay. Ignore it at your peril. It's a long-lasting and it will continue to become more refined as uh, with long-lasting implications to both carriers and drivers' ability to compete in the marketplace. Increasingly, shippers and insurance carriers will benchmark this data to drive competitive pricing decisions that will affect both revenue and expense. Drivers' records will reflect their performance individually and will affect their ability to continue employment in this field. Make no mistake, whether or not you manage this information, it will affect you. So only motor carriers that rise to the challenges, that ch adopt new attitudes, new perspectives, and transition and engage their drivers as part of the solution will be able to survive and thrive. Also, the good news is you're not alone. Hub International Risk Services and our vendor partners have practical support solutions to help you in your journey. So, just a reminder here, strategic next steps for, for carriers. Review and update your SMS core data and establish a regular routine to review and update the information regularly. In addition to that, establish, understand there's a new line of scrimmage in the compliance game, and establish a driver policy for immediate notification of all roadside inspection and enforcement events. Develop a review process uh, to intake and manage that information on the front end. Stop the stupid mistakes. Put your pants on, drivers, before you go out on the road. Make sure you have your medical cards and your licenses. Carriers, evaluate your owner-operator contracts for the terms and responsibilities. Also, ensure that you've got a remedial training clause in your contract where you can require your owner-operators to attend safety and remedial training uh, to ensure that they become skilled and knowledgeable uh, in the areas of CSA compliance. You want to continue to engage your drivers as part of the solution. Train, train, train. Daily vehicle inspections out of service criteria. Everyone that they catch on the line before they're starting the day or at the end of the day is one less violation and one less scoring opportunity that the DOT has. Also, hours of service and logs. They need to be knowledgeable. Uh, very knowledgeable and, and complete them in a correct form and manner. You want to review your policies and procedures for compliance effectiveness and then contact your hub risk services consultants to discuss an, a resource or utilizing some of the CSA compliance tools 
and strategies and resources that we're continuously exploring and developing. We're here to help you and support in this process. I'll now turn this back over to Todd McCumber for questions and follow-up. All right. Thanks, Stan and Jason. I appreciate it. Definitely a, a great topic. Can't really cover it enough in an hour, but uh, I think we made a, a good impact on it. A couple things before I turn it over to questions. We have a number of uh, key references and resources that I put up on the, um, on the presentation at this point. Uh, CSA's website, Pre-Employment Screening Program, the SMS Information Center, Safety Management System Inquiry, Data Cues, Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, and then we're going to share with you uh, our contact information if you have any follow-up questions. So there are a number of references and resources out there, <clears throat> but definitely I, I would tell you if there's uh, some very specific questions, if you need some guidance, uh, contact any, any one of us would be a good first call as well. Then uh, one last thing before the questions, uh, I do want to have an announcement um, on our next webinar. <clears throat> we are uh, doing a webinar on September 20th of this year on proactive school security and emergency planning, trends and best practices for a safer school year. Really, we're going to talk about techniques and strategies around uh, emergency planning, uh, security management. Although this one is a little more specific to schools, really the strategies that are employed and going to be discussed during this webinar can really apply to in the industry. Uh, so definitely a great topic uh, conducted by Mike Dubose, who is our practice leader for emergency response, business continuity, and security management solutions. So uh, the sign up and registration is on the bottom of the page. You will also have that on hubinternational.com. Uh, so please, if this is a if this is a topic that interests you, uh, please sign up right away. All right, enough of the uh, enough of the commercials. Uh, do you want to open it up for a little bit of questions? I think we have um, about seven minutes left on the hour commitment. Uh, that we had to you in terms of, uh, you know, talking about some questions that you may have. I've fielded a couple questions um, uh, online just to, um, just to reiterate the responses that I had in that. Uh, for those people that are looking for copies of the presentation, they are currently on hubnarnational.com. Also, if you send one of us an email, we can send you a PDF of the presentation as well. Uh, so definitely it's something good to have in your files. Um, so this information is available right away. Uh, at this point, we can turn it uh, turn over to the operator to uh, gather some questions for us. In order to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. We have no questions. Oh, we do. We have a question from Ramon Gonzalez of Grady Construction. Hey, how you doing, guys? Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a math. Two questions. One mathematical, because I have reviewed the uh, the violations over the last uh, two months. I'm sorry, two years, but I'm not at my office right now. I'm actually calling from home. On the on the OOS, you get an additional two points. So that's let's say you get a violation that's three points. You add the two, then you multiply, or you add the two on the back end. Uh, you it generally it's done on the front end, and multiplier kicks in after that for the time waiting. Yeah, so for everybody listening, that's a that that, that out of service adds up quickly. You know, when you, you when you get that with the multiplier. And the other question actually came up this morning. One of the supervisors gave me a call. We well, this is on the weight, uh, on the scale thing. We had, we had gotten some limestone, you know, from someone who weighs it is and so forth. We got pulled over and we were overweight, 4,000 pounds or something to that effect. Uh, and is it worthwhile to then, because we're not equipped with scales of our own, to, to, uh, to argue that and, and get a, uh, a ticket either from the limestone company or, or, or one of the uh, truck stops and get away? You know, and I'm just, this just happened today and I don't know, I'm probably asking a picky question, but I was, because, because an officer can always just say, you know, you drop some of your load and reweight it. Um, well, that's probably a specific response question. I, I would suggest that um, you consider scaling your loads uh, to uh, to see what kind of uh, tolerances that that you are um, hauling, um, right. and then follow up. Um, uh, you know, you can always go and, and scale the load following that um, and make sure that, uh, you know, you, you, don't, uh, you, you don't open yourself up to that uh, allegation of you went and dumped part of your load. Um, you can, 
I, you know, and I can take you, uh, we can go offline and maybe discuss some more of the specifics of this, but it, it may be a, a hard one to try and defend. Um, the key is to just make sure you're using good guidelines on mm -hmm. your scales. Do, 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 when they load them, do they not scale them at the quarry? Yeah, that's why we were concerned, you see. Uh, and this is the first time it's come up, and before we've always been trusting and so forth, and we've had meetings where we've made the, the, the drivers the responsible, not the operators. You know, we carry in primarily the issue with dump trucks carrying various loads, whether it's cement, whether it's sand, whether it's peat gravel, and, you know, you know, we, we, we make that the responsibility of the drivers, uh, you know, knowing that, you, like you, the word you use, tolerance, I like that word. Uh, but in this case, you know, here we are leaving from the limestone company, who knows, who weighs it because they're charging us, you know, the amount of limestone, and then minutes later we get charged being over 4,000 pounds. So it just looked odd. Now, granted, we, I don't know the results of us going to the truck stop and what happened there, but well, I would, um, you know, let's take this specific question offline. If you'll give me a call afterwards, I'll, we can talk at it, uh, that one a little further. I, when I find it further, but basically I was just, you know, to what degree can you become uh, where you defend yourself and so forth? Right. We, we, um, you can challenge things on the data queue, but you need to make sure that you have good evidentiary material. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just happened to be today and it was on my mind. <laughs> Your next question comes from Stephen Bark of Schneider Paper Company. I was questioning the vehicle miles traveled. Where do they get that information from, and how could I determine if that's accurate? Well, you report that, actually, um, on your MCS 150. Uh-huh. And uh, that's been reported, uh, and that's you need to make sure that that information is, is right because that's self-reported. Isn't that once a year reporting? It can, you can update it monthly. Okay, maybe that's what I'm missing here then. Okay. Um, so uh, you need to take a look at it, make sure that, you know, the number reflects the average number of vehicle miles traveled per vehicle in your fleet. That's the, the quick and dirty check that I do. And then, um, you know, and, and when you got a tractor-trailer operator going, you know, you're averaging 30,000 miles per truck in your fleet, and they go, no way, you know. <laughs> well, They've, they've underreported some clerk or somebody in filing that paperwork has, has underreported. Okay, thank you. At this time, there are no further questions. Okay, great. Well, uh, again, uh, let me reemphasize that uh, slides and, and copies of the presentation will be available uh, on hubinternational.com. I'm already starting to get some emails, so that's good. Uh, if we get some emails to us as well, uh, we can send you a PDF of the uh, presentation. So appreciate everybody attending. Uh, hopefully you found the topic useful. Uh, definitely, I, it sounds like maybe there's, uh, there's a, a large you know, amount of interest in this topic, so I think we might uh, try to follow up at some point with some additional topics related to it. Uh, but certainly appreciate everybody's involvement, and uh, look for us on September 20th with our uh, school security and business continuity and emergency planning webinar. Thanks. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by.